Hi everyone, my name is Erin Shornick, and I think we'll get started um, with today's event. Um, I'd like to welcome you to um, Fishing Networks, uncovering those behind illegal fishing in global South countries. Um, Joe is a range of experts um, to discuss a recent report that um, the Financial Transparency, um, otherwise known as the, the Coalition, as the FTC has put out, um, where we discuss uh, the, the issue of unreported illegal and unregulated fishing and the beneficial owners behind this illicit trade that drains US $23.5 billion every year, mainly from global South countries amid a cost of living crisis. And so in this discussion, we hope to um, dig a little deeper into the findings of this new report. And um, based on the extensive analysis of IUU cases to date, and analyze whether financial transparency reforms can end this illicit trade. And so joining us today, again, as I said, is a range of um, experts, uh, two, of the, uh, two of the authors of the report, Alfonso Daniels has joined us, Nicholas Gutman from Foundation CIES. Um, we also have uh, colleagues from Stop the Be Bleeding Campaign, Mukasari Sebana, uh, another colleague from Pew Charitable Trust, Gina Fiore. And then last but not least, we have um, Gabriella Kosman from the Oceans team at the Norwegian Agency for Development Cooperation, otherwise known as NORAD. So thank you for joining us today, panelists, and thank you for um, joining us, um, attendees. Just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, the question and answer box, which can be found at the bottom of your Zoom um, uh, screen can be used at any time throughout the discussion and I'll be monitoring it and we'll raise these questions accordingly as the discussion continues. Um, also, we have simultaneous translation in English and Spanish offered today. So there's also another um, icon that looks like a globe at the bottom of your screen that says interpretation. If you click on that and you choose um, the language that you prefer, you will be um, able to listen to the entire uh, presentation in English or Spanish simultaneously translated. Um, just note, please, that the event today is recorded and that um, we will uh, be happy to facilitate any of the questions that you have now, or if there's any that follow the presentations um, in the chat box or um, Q&A box or by email, we'll be happy to continue the discussion from here on out. Um, just to say that uh, some of the questions that we seek to um, discuss today and, and find some answers to is whether the current efforts um, are enough to ensure greater financial and public beneficial ownership transparencies in the um, fishery sectors is happening. Um, will they have an impact on the IEU fishing globally? Like is, is the, the solutions we're raising actually the point, um, can lessons be drawn from other sectors such as extractive industries where financial transparency initiatives like beneficial ownership registries have been put in place, um, would that be beneficial to this sector? And finally, um, we'll be able to discuss any other ideas that you as attendees may have as experts in your own right. So without further ado, I wanted to turn it over to Alfonso and Nicholas um, who were, again, the co-authors of the report, um, Fishing Networks and Covering Those Behind Illegal Fishing in Global South Countries that was just recently published um, as a financial transparency flagship uh, project. So, Alfonso and Nicholas, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Irene. Um, I'm going to start with a presentation. It's more than a year of investigation. And, and work to develop this report that was launched a few weeks ago. And I will share my screen where I'll give a quick presentation if that's okay. Um, I wonder if everyone can see the screen? Yes. Great. So um, this, this report from FTC and Fundación says, but before going into the report itself, it's important to know why why are we focusing on uh, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, IU fishing, as a technical term? We, we, 90 percent, more than 90 percent of assessed marine stocks are in danger, according to the UN, and IU fishing accounts for up to a fifth of global fishing catches. That means 
that it's a key contributor to overfishing at the moment. This is equivalent to up to $23.5 billion a year. That's in illicit financial flows that are being funneled, drained from mainly global South countries to the North, to global North countries. So it's a huge loss. And that's happening amid the cost of living crisis, as you were saying, Aaron, and also amid uh, inflation and, and, and issues of climate change, the impact of climate change. Um, IU fishing is also the third most lucrative natural resource crime after timber and mining. Yet, this is such a huge problem, but we know very little about who, who exactly is behind IU fishing, who is behind the vessels involved in IU fishing. And that was the purpose of this report, which really for the first time looks into detail about, about who, if it's possible to figure out who is behind this. So just to very quickly uh, summarize the methodology that we used, we looked at, we built a data set from January 2010 to May 2022. That's nearly a thousand vessels. We're talking always of industrial and semi-industrial vessels, not traditional vessels. And that's taken from NGO reports, from um, news organizations, reputed news organizations, but also from government agencies and regional fisheries management organizations. That's four times more than the list from these management organizations um, have. So we, we sort of build this massive database, very big database of IU fishing. And then with that information, we looked at the legal owners of these vessels at the time of the reported violation using Lloyd's. And um, Lloyd's data set, which is the largest data set of vessels in the world. Once we have that information, we looked at the beneficial owners of those vessels, who was who the specific people behind those companies, not just the company, not, like, not just the legal owners. And despite using the best sources available, we we're only able to find company data for around 43% of the vessels and around 16% um, beneficial owners for all the vessels. So what are, were the main findings of the report? The first one was that Africa concentrates half of identified IU vessels, 40% happening in West Africa alone. Then you have, this is equivalent to Africa losing almost $11.5 billion in illicit financial flows linked to IU fishing, 2.2 billion in Argentina a year, and which is equivalent to two times its wine exports, and $4 billion for Indonesia. That's a massive, massive amount of money that's being lost by those countries. Um, in, uh, you can see by the um, by pie chart there where the location of where we are able to find the location of defenses, 22%, around 23% almost in Latin America, then Africa, as I mentioned, almost half, half and then uh, essentially Asia as well. So sorry, Latin America is around 15%, Asia is 22%. The second finding that we found is that a third of the IU vessel companies, the legal owners, were from China, followed by Spain, South Korea, Taiwan, and Thailand. The third major finding we had is like, who are the 10 top companies that we identified as being behind IU fishing? And the interesting element there is that we found that it's a very concentrated sector. The top 10 represent around a quarter, almost a quarter of all identified IU fishing vessels. That's the vessels for which we're able to identify the company behind. Eight are from China, it's not too surprising. One is from Colombia and one is from Spain. The largest company is at the bottom is Pintan, and that's actually um, partly owned by the Chinese state and it's listed in the NASDAQ. The second company in the list, CN, FC, China National Overseas Fisheries Corporation, is wholly owned by the Chinese state. And the Spanish company mentioned there is um, actually receiving millions of dollars in uh, EU and other subsidies. The fourth big finding for us was that a third of vessels were flagged, IU vessels were flagged to China, another third were to around nine to 10 other countries, which is Ghana, South Korea, and Peru around 8%, 9% of vessels use flags of convenience. And that's because of their very lax controls and 
in almost non-existent taxes in those uh, like Panama, etc. And I won't go into detail really on the recommendations because that's something that the panel should should address, and I would be interested to hear about that. But clearly, um, bio transparency and bio registries. Whoever registers a vessel should be able to um, identify who is the beneficial owner of that vessel. There should be a unified list of IU fishing vessels, which is not ex does not exist at the moment. There are a lot of gaps. In the system is financial transparency is just one among many other chains that need to be addressed and there will be that I, I prefer to leave it there and give the floor to to nicolas so we can talk more in detail about about argentina and latin america thank you very much alfonso well, um, I will just address the uh, specific case of Argentina that we did through um, this report. And I think there is, um, I'll do a little bit of um, uh, a background of what would happen in Argentina, because I think it is a basket case um, for all the ground reasons of what is actually happening in IUU fishing. Um, and I think the other thing it is very interesting is that um, uh, with Alfonso um, saying um, the report is very focused on the financial aspects of um, what is going on in IEO fishing um, around the world. Uh, in with this, something that is very important is to name the companies and to name the people that are perpetrating these crimes because otherwise um, there is not a real work behind. So part of that, and I think the a really strong value of this. Um, of those reports and this work is that we actually name the companies and we know who are committing those crimes against nature and also financial crimes and that are also related to IUU fishing. And in that say, um, I will like to be give a little bit of a context. So um, in what happened uh, in the case of Argentina is that in the 1990s, the Spanish fishing fleet was kicked out from the African West Coast um, including Morocco, Namibia, and Mauritania, Mauritania, where Spaniards were depleting the fish stocks at a rate that was affecting the food supply and the economy of hundreds of coastal African towns and cities. And the consequence of that was a large fleet and workforce that stayed idle and mostly Spanish and losing billions and billions of dollars. And as well, it was a strong increase in seafood prices um, across Europe. Um, in that context, um, the European Economic Community at the time, that was previously the European Union, signed a treaty with Argentina in 1994, in which the fleet that was kicked out from West Africa was relocated to Argentina. And the result of that, that in just within two years was the collapse of the hay biomass and other important fisheries, <clears throat> sorry, and a long period of pans that was enacted for the first time in over a century of commercial fishing. So inland, most of the local fishing companies were bankrupt and were sold to foreign companies or become subsidiaries of larger foreign companies. So in other words, what was happening is that the, the early stage of an increasing depletion of fishing stocks from rich northern global countries into the developing world and the global south, and the use of advanced technology, subsidies, and unjust access to protected markets. And this is a little bit of what happened earlier um, to take is what, what's happening now. And so nowadays, China and South Korea are replacing to a large extent Spain and other European fleets of the 1990s in terms of IEU fishing and in terms of like doing these captures outside the legal framework that is in place. So the legal frameworks have been increased and been a um, little, it's better nowadays. Now the players, uh, the main players in IEU fishing as uh, Alfonso has mentioned is today China. So this is, situation is not unlike what happened in other Latin American hand, countries. Um, and that has pushed IEU fishing, not only I mean, within the countries, because there is a large competition for those resources. The coastal zones rich in biomass are disputed then by small subsistence fishermen, local small and medium scale business, and now large and local and foreign fleets and illegal fleets. And what we're seeing is that this new fleets, whether legal and illegal, are displacing small scale fisheries that are by itself more sustainable. 
And I want to just mention something that as we research for this report unfold, and I think that is something important to remark is that IEU fishing is not only done by illegal ships entering exclusive economic zone, which is the most common way in which IEU happens, but it's also a standard practice throughout the legal fleet operating in countries. I mean, and this is done by this by different means. One is like illegal discards, shark finning, fishing in closed zones within the economic zones in which they're supposedly um, capturing legally, and then undocumented and unreported workforce on board and in transshipment outside the economic zone of undeclared catches. So all of that part of that is also IEU is happening not only in the um, IEU um, fleet, mostly Chinese and Korean that Alfonso has mentioned, but we need to understand as well that also legal companies that are actually supposedly acting legally within our countries, they do a lot of IEU fishing. And this is um, in also by underreporting the real value of what they, they catch. And this is the another important thing that I would like to address is that how incredibly um, underdeveloped the systems for um, control are in place. And this is not by coincidence. So what we're seeing is like um, the, rig the control of um, fishing, whether it's legal and to prevent illegal fishing, um, it's not much different from what would have been in 1922, 100 years ago. So most of the, in the case of Argentina, um, the um, catching of uh, the, um, the arrival to port and all the processes once to arrival and um, arrival into port um, is done by just paperwork, but it's not done by um, real advanced, uh, you know, port technologies that are not put in place. Uh, so this is another big problem that we're facing. So um, I think the aspect that we have also um, research in this is how the financial aspects of feed into beneficial owners and how the money is being funneled out of through IEU fishing. But we also need to understand that this is not only happening in IEU fleet that has not, you know, um, the rights to um, catch or go to see in zones. In the other um, important aspect that I would like um, also to address is uh, that China is planning the port construction and facilities to assist distant water fleet in the South Atlantic. Um, and this is happening nowadays in Mauritania, Santo Tomé and Principe, Guinea Bissau, Sierra Leone, Namibia, Gabon, Cameroon, and Angola. And for instance, um, the Chinese group Shandong Baoma Fisher Group has been discussing with the Uruguayan government the construction of a private, totally private port next to the Montevideo port for about $300 million. Uh, just that will, in, in that way, that will facilitate um, the catcheries in South Atlantic. This is very interesting since most of the Chinese fleet do not have quotas to catch in the South Atlantic. So it will mostly be uh, put in place to help IEU fishing. And then again, this is very, um, you know, and um, then it, it's a problem since the port of Montevideo in Uruguay is considered the second most active in the world for undeclared fish catch. And it's in a strategic port uh, for um, illegal um, IEU fishing in the South Atlantic. But it's not only for that, unfortunately, Uruguay being, um, becoming, being a nation as a buffer state was 200 years ago, part of it was just to create this place for smuggling and it's still up to this day. So the port of Montevideo in our research has showed that it's a very big problem for IEU fishing if it keeps on expanding as it's as of today, um, it is also one of the uh, main ports for illegal um, and smuggling and um, smuggling of soybean and timber from Uruguay and Argentina. So um, I think that uh, what we're seeing in here is um, there is a lot of problems related to the financial aspects of uh, illegal fishing, but it's also in terms of public policy. Uh, yes, and I, I will be. Um, Wrapping up, it's a problem of public policy that we're looking at um, since 
all of the displaced um, uh, forests of like uh, fishing fleets in the case of Africa are being put in, in other places and that that creates uh, an, uh, a very pressure for sustainable practices to become illegal, even for sustainable fishery, like sustainable small uh, fishermen and small localities into become illegal fishing. And then again, and just to wrap up, um, I think it is very, the same happen in other, as it happened in another <clears throat> um, sectors like mining and forestry. Uh, not only the China is the, uh, the main actor here in IEU fishing, but at the same time, most of the IEU fishing is happening within a very uh, small group of big companies. So this is also has to have the support uh, of various levels, not just the local the, the governments that are behind that, in this case, China, but as we've seen in the case of Argentina, that happened at the point with the European Union. And then there is also this idea that um, we do have the technology to be able to put in place to stop that, in, especially within ports, but also in within the fleets and the ships themselves. But the technology that is used is not good, not because we don't have it, but because there is a huge lobby from the same companies and sometimes from the countries to prevent that to happen because there is, uh, as Alfonso had mentioned before, uh, this is a business, an illegal business of over 20 to $30 billion a year. So they do have support from uh, to large extent from the countries that are behind that, and especially the big fishing countries like Spain and China that are also seeing that as a geopolitical problem to feed their own populations and to keep on uh, and to keep up with this, um, the, with this scheme of IEU fishing. So, um, um, I think it's my time now, and I will um, leave the floor. So, Irene, thank you so much. Great. Thank you. That's um, really illuminating uh, information in the scale of the problem, but also shining light on how little we know. So, I think it's very um, interesting to see both sides of the same coin in terms of the, you know, scale again of the problem and to discuss where to where the strategic entry points, um, both politically, but then realistically to address some of these um, financial crime aspects of the IEU fishing industry. And um, I, what sounds to me like even more um, opacity entering the sector um, and making it even more difficult to understand like who the actual humans are behind um, these activities as opposed to, you know, subsidiaries of subsidiaries um, of Chinese companies, for example. Um, so I think that leads really nicely into um, some points that our colleague Gina, who's an officer with the Ending, Illicial, Ending Illegal Fishing Project at Pew Charitable Trust hopes uh, to raise with us today. I mean, some of the main points are, okay, once we figure out who some of the actual people are behind these um, illicit activities are and the illicit flows, um, what's the likelihood of prosecution? What are some of the challenges? What are what, what does that look like? Um, also figuring out how financial transparency measures can be useful. So as I said previously, um, we've seen uh, financial transparency such as beneficial ownership registries um, playing a big part in um, oil, gas, and mineral sectors and have um, impacted the way that um, investigations are done there and how some of the policies and procedures and practices in real life of companies are carried out um, in those sectors. And so what lessons can we learn from those sectors and um, adapt to this um, problem that's existed for quite some time, but I think is emerging with um, a confluence of financial transparency potential solutions within an existing problem. So with that, Gina, please, I'm happy to hear your thoughts. Uh, well, first, thank you so much for having me today. Um, I'm really excited to talk about illegal fishing. So I think the first thing to keep in mind is that um, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, it's not just one thing. Within each letter, so the I, the U, and the U, are different types of um, criminal laws and regulatory infractions, um, which is one of the major problems with, make, with, um, with prosecution and um, and and bringing these um, these bad actors to justice, essentially, um, illegal fishing 
as one thing is not, um, it, it's, that's not necessarily a crime in one or two countries. And I think there is beginning to be this, like this small, this push towards making illegal fishing just its own crime. Um, but in most countries, it's just a series of um, regulatory infractions. It's a series of like, of low level um, criminal, um, low level crimes uh, with low level prosecutions and low level fines. Um, one of the one of the things that um, I have heard said about IEU fishing is that IEU fishing is a um, it's a low it's a low risk high reward crime and in many cases um, the if a vessel is caught um, with illegal gear uh, dumping bycatch shark finning um, fishing without a license fishing with a fake license you know all these different things that you know are within the umbrella of IUU, a lot of times getting caught is the cost of doing business. Um, and with the big industrial companies, um, it is baked into their budget essentially. Um, so I think the first thing we really should remember is that um, it's such a mishmash of, of um, infractions. And, and so going to, each country isn't going to have, I mean, we're not gonna have like a, a general sort of um, prosecutorial um, um, sort of method for um, each infraction in each country. Um, we're not gonna have the same penalties for each infraction in each country. Um, and it's really up to the political will um, of each coastal state and each flag state, every country that's flagging a vessel or um, is opening up their exclusive economic zone or their territorial waters to fishing, um, it's really up to them to have the, uh, the right, the adequate prosecutions to make IUU fishing a, um, a low reward, high risk endeavor. Um, so that's the first thing I kind of wanted to point out. The other issue, um, is that IEU fishing um, and all of the different fishing specific issues like crimes and regulatory infractions don't, you know, it's not just those types of things that happen on fishing vessels. There are also what we call convergence crimes. Um, they're crimes that aren't necessarily fisheries related, but they happen on fishing vessels, they happen around fishing vessels. Um, so that can be things like uh, using a fishing vessel to smuggle um, anything essentially drugs. We're seeing a lot more drugs smuggled on fishing vessels. Um, we have seen instances of, um, of weapons smuggled on fishing vessels, of uh, people, um, human trafficking happening on fishing vessels. Um, and so um, financial trans increasing the financial transparency of, um, of the fishing industry in general, I think would be, is something that would be very important um, to ending that type of convergence crime um, in the fishing industry. I also, I failed to mention corruption, bribery, fraud, um, having two different sets of books, um, on la fish laundering, what we call fish laundering, uh, taking your fish and saying it's, um, it's something cheap when it's something actually that's very expensive and high priced um, in order to evade uh, export duty and taxes. Um, so, I mean, there's just, there are so many things that happen on these fishing vessels and in this fishing industry. And so it makes, um, it's almost a little bit like a game of like a carnival game that we, in the United States called whack-a-mole, where you're, you know, just hitting with, you know, your mallet and you get one crime and then like two other like small things pop up. And while they add up, they also make, um, they make overall prosecution difficult. And I think the other thing we should mention is the, um, the conditions on these fishing vessels. Um, Nicholas mentioned it before, but fishing vessels, they're very old. They are not, especially these big industrial fishing vessels, they're old, they're not well maintained. Um, many fishers work in, uh, in appalling conditions for very low wages and they're on these vessels for six months, 12 months, sometimes 18 months, their passports are sometimes taken. They're not allowed off the vessel. They cannot leave the vessel, even when the vessel comes into port. Um, because of different immigration and visa issues. They cannot get off that vessel. They cannot seek medical attention. They cannot go to a grocery store to get food. Um, 
I wanted to also point out new research um, released uh, with the Pew released with the Fish Safety Foundation um, just showed that uh, the initial sort of number of the estimate of deaths uh, by fishing uh, of fishing crew on fishing vessels. We used to think that was 24,000 fishers dying every year. New research, research shows that that's actually, um, that's over 100,000 fishers that lose their life every year in the fishing industry, um, either on a vessel, around a vessel, um, doing smaller scale sort of subsistence diving um, for um, um, high value types of uh, seafood such as abalone and lobster. Um, so that's uh, just another reason why we we really do need we need this we need increased financial transparency. We need to know who these ultimate beneficial owners are, who these people are that um, that not only um, ultimately pro they control where this vessel goes, but they ultimately profit. Um, the and the I think maybe the last point um, I want to make because I don't think I have a lot of time left. Um, the last point I want to make is that the fishing industry is incredibly opaque. Um, you can have a fishing industrial fishing vessel that is flagged to one country that is uh, with a registered owner in a second country, the beneficial owner in a third country, operated and crewed and captained by somebody in a fourth country. It makes prosecutions um, very, very difficult because there are a lot of different um, national uh, sort of interests involved. Um, and then when you add in uh, additional countries um, maybe involved in the tracking of that fishing company or that fishing vessel, um, where that fishing vessel has fish, does it have a license in a separate or two or three different exclusive economic zones, um, trying to figure out where that vessel has been, uh, where they have landed their catch, um, it becomes very complicated. Uh, very quickly. It takes a lot of resources, especially in these high level IUU fishing cases, it takes a lot of resources to ultimately uh, find that vessel, interdict that vessel, bring it to a port and bring it to justice. Um, and so that's, you know, in the end, that's why we need um, additional, um, we need additional transparency. We need financial transparency. We need to know who owns these vessels ultimately. Um, we need to know where the beyond beneficial ownership, we need public licenses. Um, we need countries to have up to date um, uh, fishing registry, fishing vessel registries. Uh, we need the beneficial ownership information to be public. So civil society groups, um, especially in these coastal states, uh, know who is who is ultimately extracting the fish from their water and taking it from their country back to you know a larger like global north country um so yes uh it's a great report thank you so much for having me great thank you gina you raised really um interesting points about the linkages to other what we would call predicate offenses which um you know underlie money laundering and the that the figures in the report alone are shocking and um, enough to, to raise eyebrows, but then add in all the other illicit financial flows linked to all the other trafficking and other um, illicit activity that, that's, that's happening on and around the vessels. So I think that, you know, it, it again shines a light and is not uncommon on some, it's not an uncommon characteristic that we see in other extractives industries that um, share similar characteristics of other illicit um, activities and predicate offenses that um, just augment those illicit financial flows even further and um, you know separate those who are carrying out um, these bad deeds um, to becoming more and more wealthy while others are left to um, suffer the consequences. Um, I think looking at a different side of the report, um, a few figures were raised in the report where nearly half of uh, all IUU uh, vessels for which the data that was analyzed um, uh, was looked at um, took place in Africa, which was leading to an economic loss of illicit financial flows alone of up to $11.5 billion originating from the content due to IUU fishing. And so, you know, we also see that some of the most affected subregions um, in the world is West Africa, where 40% of the global IEU fishing took place, 
with a loss of up to $9.4 billion in illicit financial flows. I mean, these numbers are staggering. Um, and, and I think that it's something that, you know, when you take into account the struggle that some of these fishing towns and people who are looking to this industry for their livelihoods and food security, um, and then also more broadly looking to it as a, a tax base, a revenue for the state um, to carry out other uh, civil and public services, um, the problem compounds um, exponentially as you dig a little deeper. And so with that, um, we'll have our colleague um, from the Stop the Bleeding campaign in Africa, the coordinator of the campaign, uh, Mukasari Sabana, um, join us and give a little bit of a perspective um, from the African civil society um, on this issue. Also help us to look at what does this mean for artisanal and small scale fishers um, and how do we uh, potentially improve their value add um, in the industry, and again, what lessons can be learned from some of the other extractive industries um, from what the African perspective is experiencing. So Mokosari, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, good morning, afternoon, and uh, evening, uh, wherever you are tuning in from. Uh, I coordinate the Stop the Bleeding uh, campaign, uh, and it's basically about um, development financing, fighting all forms of injustices uh, from tax, um, debt trade and investment um and it's important that we are having this conversation at a time when um, africa is hamstrung uh, by by is, is choked by debt uh debt distress is a big problem on the continent uh, illicit financial flows are ballooning uh we are talking about climate crisis that is ravaging the continent uh and most of the coastal um, areas uh nigeria uh scarce as an example um, is a recent case in point. Um, we are also having this conversation uh, amid this growing conflict on the continent. So it's important to understand the multiple um, impact or collateral damage if we talk about the um, legal fishing and some of the illicit activities that are taking place, uh, depriving Africa of its wealth and also uh, pushing back on the agenda for sustainable development on the continent. And efforts to recover the African Union. The position starts with that realization in 2011 that uh, the continent lacks uh, resources to finance development and was not going to um, meet the millennium sustainable, uh, the millennium development goals. And to uh, put a, the continent on a better footing in terms of mobilizing resources uh, to finance development, there was a high level panel report um, that was produced by the former president, uh, His Excellency Tabombeki, on illicit financial flows from Africa. So, what does this report show that um, then 2015, that Africa, the estimate was that it, it was losing more than 50 billion annually through illicit financial flows, and with ma major culprits being the multinational corporations. And if we look uh, at this situation that we're discussing right now in terms of illegal fishing, uh, illegal, unreported, and um, un unregulated um, um, uh, fishing, you find that again, multinational corporations are a, a, a big, uh, the big culprits in terms of siphoning resources to uh, on the continent. So this is something that is also um, reinforcing uh, the findings of uh, the Tawombeke report uh, that, 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 that largely centered on the extractive sector, the mining sector. And so we are seeing that this uh, beyond the extractive sector, uh, Africa is also losing substantial resources via um, illegal, unreported and unregulated um, uh, fishing. So that's important to underscore. And the collateral damage, I think you've captured it very well. There are food shortages on the continent. We have got malnutritional challenges on the continent. We have sustainability issues on the continent. And all these are being deprived because of some um, by, by corporate in, in, in impunity. And uh, quickly also, um, you find that uh, Africa's economy is anchored by uh, small to medium entrepreneurs. And the same applies in the mining sector and the same applies also in the uh, fishing sector. So you are talking about artisanal and small scale um, fishers or miners, but their 
their opportunity to uh, be able to grow value of their business, to try to formalize their business is being deprived by an unhealthy and an illegal um, repressive competition because of the large scale um, activities uh, done by um, the, 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 the corporates. And then let, let me put also in, in quotes that are uh, in bold rather and underline that that's corporate impunity, that's corporate impunity. And it, 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 for Africa, that becomes very painful because when you talk about slavery, when you talk about colonialism, when you talk about now climate change, you find that it is the slave owners who are compensated and not the slaves. Um, right now, when you talk about uh, the climate crisis that was suffering, corporates are making super profits at the same time uh, being involved in dirty fuels. We are talking about the chance for Africa also to be able to harness resources such as fisheries in oceans. And again, we have got to develop the countries that are planting, are uh, 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 plundering resources on the continent. So the, the the collateral damage is also manifesting in terms of how do we have a, a um, um, fair economy in which uh, those that are small and emerging can also be able to benefit uh, from from such activities. So I think that's important and important to underscore. Lastly, to address that is if uh, issue um, of of the linkages again between what's happening in the extractive sector, uh, in, in, in extractive in so far as mining, oil, and gas is concerned, and also the fisheries. I think this sheer scale of the losses is something that we are we are grappling with. Um, according to the UNC um, Economic Development in Africa report uh, for 2020, uh, it estimated that Africa is losing over 88.6 billion annually through illicit financial flows. And now we are getting an estimate that uh, from the fishery sector, we are losing about 11 billion. If you look at the percentage and what does this mean in terms of, um, or pretend in terms of capacity to deliver, um, health, education, and some of the basic services that are needed on the continent, you begin to get a sense of a proportion of the sheer weight that there's no questions at all behind what this action, the actions of the um, the, the, the corporates that are behind this uh, impunity, uh, given the historical injustice that the continent has continued to suffer. Then secondly, the issue of uh, transparency. Transparency really matters. We're just not talking about companies but we want to peep beyond the corporate veil to be able to understand who is the ultimate beneficiary. There we are raising the moral risk also ex by exposing such people. And also legally, we are creating better loopholes to be able to, uh, no, we are creating better um, bandwidth legally to be able to hold them accountable. So that's very important again. So the issue of beneficial ownership registry, which is advanced in the oil and gas sector, oil mining and gas sector, is something that also must be given attention in this sector. Um, thirdly, the impact itself on the on, on the communities that um, uh, mining by nature is, lo is location specific. It impacts largely communities around those areas, but also with fisheries, we have got coastal communities that are also dependent in terms of um, their ocean for their livelihoods and everything else. So the parallels are very clear in terms of the diabolic impact of such actions. But um, as I conclude, I just wanted to under underscore the fact that it is very important that uh, yes, the, we, this problem, we can, we can zero in it and, and have a high resolution picture of what we are facing. Um, but we also have to increase the political cost of in, the, the, the political cost of inaction. So mobilizing people so that at least they can make a politician not only from an African perspective but from a global perspective as the with efforts to fight um, uh, tax evasion and tax um, avoidance is what is needed. So that's it. I think on as I conclude. Thank you. Thank you so much, No. I, I think that you raise a good point and. As I said previously, it's the um, it's the the other side of the coin. So now we have these staggering um, figures, and I think that we're starting to increasingly understand the scope of the problem from a financial perspective, um, and figuring out the extent to which um, how much we don't know and what we don't know, um, and what that means um, in in impacting um, everything from everyday fisher person's lives to um, the bigger picture of um, state revenues and uh, basic service deliveries within those states. And so I think, you know, that this, this point you made about 
about increasing the political cost of inaction and the importance of mobilizing. Can I just ask one question and also um, raise to the attendees that there's a Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your screen. Please do go ahead and add any questions you have for any of the panelists. And I'll um, be happy to weave those questions in as we proceed. But I'm just wondering, um, Mukasari, if you could speak just a little bit about at what um, stage are we in Africa in um, public awareness and mobilization of uh, communities um, it, to, in, to begin or to carry on dialogues with pol pol political figures um, to sort of raise that cost of inaction? What, what stage are we at currently in terms of community mobilization? Yeah, I think to start with, there are lessons that we can borrow with the other efforts that has been uh, taken on the continent to fight illicit financial flows. Um, sorry, my, my network is, uh, there, there, there are people around, uh, so I, I hope you will forgive me for the background noises because that's only the place I can get better network. So just just to say, um, to, to reiterate the point that I was making, that um, there are already some from the past three of Mira. There are some things that we can learn on how we can be able to navigate this in terms of raising awareness. With the illicit financial flows, uh, it took um, Tabo Mbeki, the former pres then the, uh, the president of South Africa, uh, to uh, bring this attention of the AU um, at that high political level. So it's also identifying champions in these co coastal areas. Uh, it could be the current president of Senegal, uh, who is also the chairperson of the AU to say, look, this is what we are confronted with amid this the, uh, myriad of challenges that we are dealing with. So it becomes a very key point to do that. The second point of it is also to uh, understand that um, uh, this problem is not about only coastal communities. It's also about all actors in Africa that are, um, are working on human rights. Uh, you could be working on uh, from a feminist angle, you can be looking, looking at it from a labor angle, you could be looking at it from um, health education. There is convergence here that let's work together. Let us make this a priority issue in terms of um, keeping um, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing because of the sheer impact of the resources that are leaking. Yeah. So it's another important area to say, let us move together the more the merrier in terms of the numbers of advocacy so this is what really needs to be done but i must say also to respond to your question directly we have been more preoccupied with uh, what's happening in the oil gas and mineral sectors and more so now with the energy transition in minerals but at, at an opportunity cost of more advocacy of uh, advocates around the uh, illegal fishing but with this awareness and realization I think it changes the matrix of our, um, of our or, or the, or the, the portfolio of our program when it comes to financing for development on the continent. So this is what I, I, I can end with now. Now, that's really interesting to bring in the sort of strategies of top down and um, bottom up in terms of increasing that cost and finding champions. What has been the progress um, in getting attention from the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, the ITI, for example, um, to take up this issue for any of the panels who may know, but also for you, Muxari, from the African perspective and taking on um, uh, the fisheries as an extractive um, a sector that should include financial transparency measures. Because um, as far as I understand, not all countries view uh, fisheries as an extractive sector. And so I think it's um, interesting to know what are some of the obstacles in getting EITI mm -hmm. to um, raise the profile of this issue um, with, within that network and within those um, states that participate in that initiative. Yeah, maybe just just to quickly highlight the point that some few two points, right? The first one is that um, from uh, the political cost, I had left the point the, the the issue about humanizing this. It's important that we put a human face to it, um, so that at least we understand these are not just numbers. This is not just fish, but what is the human impact uh, behind this whole um, activity? Uh, then uh, for EITI, I think it is important to note that uh, the bulk of the EITI members are in Africa. 
I know Liberia, for instance, they've included um, their deliberate that timber is part of the um, a, what what they are focusing on. So I think it's also a question of choices that uh, people should be, uh, the, the countries should be influenced and be able to uh, stem their feet that, um, uh, to stand their ground to say, this should also be part of the uh, extractive industry. Contextualizing it at, their, at, at, at country level, I think that's very important. And also for West African uh, Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative, uh, a regional body that also looks at uh, West Africa becomes very key. Then for civil society, uh, the alternative mining in Dava is the flagship uh, program on the continent that looks at the extractive sector. And I know it started in terms of how do we also expand beyond mining oil and gas to look at other natural resources, timber, uh, fisheries, and so forth. So with such more compelling evidence coming in, I think it's easier so that we can regroup and recalibrate, like I, I said, in terms of our portfolio um, to, to be able to include um, uh, fisheries. Thank you. Sure. Gina, did you have uh, some thoughts on that? that um, just briefly, um, we were talking about EITI. I just wanted to mention FITI, the Fisheries in Industry Transparency Initiative, um, which is um, which looks strictly at fisheries. Um, they're based in the Seychelles. It's a it, admittedly, it is a small um, transparency initiative that uh, you know just started maybe say four or five years ago, um, you know, knowing that EITI has had like a 20 year head start, essentially. Um, there are probably, there are definitely things that um, FITI, F-I-T-I, could uh, potentially learn lessons uh, identified from EITI. Um, but I think we're growing sort of a, um, the fisheries industry and fishery um, uh, counter IUU groups and civil society um, are growing this sort of like organic uh, transparency initiative uh, within the fishery sector. Um, you know, it, it could use more funding, it could use more, uh, more support. And I would, you know, really encourage uh, financial transparency groups and fisheries groups to really, you know, to consider reaching out to FITI um, and, and helping them sort of grow um, from where they are right now, they're doing a, a, they're doing good work with a very small staff and a small budget. Great, thanks, um, Gabriella Kosman, um, who's a senior advisor with the Oceans team at the um, Norwegian Agency for Development Cooperation, otherwise known as NORAD. Um, I think it would be interesting to hear your perspective on how you view um, international organization development organizations role in um, contributing to the tackling the issues in the IE fishing um, sector and issue that we just raised um, here today in this discussion and some of your your perspectives about how those um, efforts can be better linked to issues of beneficial ownership transparency um, as one solution among many others. Um, similarly, from an international perspective, I think it would be interesting to learn um, what you're seeing is happening now um, and what some of the challenges are and what some of those other entry points are similar to the, to the 50 or uh, initiative or any others that you know, are on your radar and that um, you are, are seeing some value in, in um, supporting and, and advancing. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Erin, and thank you for having me. Um, this is a very interesting discussion. It's a very complex discussion. It uh, covers a lot of fields, a lot of areas. Um, and first of all, I just want to say uh, congrats with the report, Fishy Networks. Um, this report highlights a lot of really uh, important, uh, you know, areas uh, there uh, where there's need for a lot of efforts, but that effort comes both from, you know, governments, from private sector, from research, it comes from development partners, such as the one I work for, I work for the Norwegian Agency for Development Corporation. So NORAD has a portfolio on fisheries uh, and ocean matters. Uh, we have some support to, uh, to IUU, uh, combating IUU. We have it through uh, civil society. Uh, one project that we have in, in West Africa 
is with the, the West Africa Task Force under the Fisheries Committee for the West Central Gulf of Guinea. And this is uh, in partnership with Trigma Tracking, TMT. Um, and we have supported them for quite a long time. Um, I think they showcase how important the regional cooperation is and the regional focus because they uh, work with six uh, countries in, in this region, trying to build up uh, a trust between them and um, a collaboration and a platform where they, uh, where they can share information and work on IAU issues together. Not an, easy, not an easy task, but it's very important. So. Um, and in addition, I think I can see that, for example, in the UNODC, uh, UNODC has, I think it's referred to in the report, uh, published a, a guide on addressing corruption in the fishery sector. So this report or this guide came out in 2019. So the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crimes, they have these global programs, right? And they have one on fisheries they, and wildlife crime, but they also have an anti-corruption program. So what we're trying to do now with our support from uh, an agency with, um, with uh, official development assistance funds available, we're trying to support them to actually build these bridges between the global programs so they don't work in silo because this is very much interlinked. And I also wanted to um, mention that a way, um, now in 2017, we also co-financed the report. Uh, and I think this is also mentioned um, is chasing red herrings. So this report is on flags of convenience, secrecy, and the impact on fisheries crime law enforcement. In this report, there is a number of recommendations. Uh, beneficial ownership, information about this, sharing about this, uh, recognize, you know, flags of convenience are more or less tax havens on sea. There's so many issues here that needs to be worked on from different angles. Um, and this still stands. So, I mean, the recommendations that come out from this report, they still stand. Uh, I would also say that it was mentioned by, by Gina, you know, all these uh, economic crimes that are linked, uh, you know, uh, you have a trace of them. Everything from document forgery from the beginning, uh, registration or identity fraud, food fraud, document fraud, insurance fraud, money laundering, tax crime, corruption, bribery, trafficking of persons or drugs, smuggling, other things. Uh, there's like a huge range of things that are linked to this area in many cases. So that makes it, you know, from our point of view, when we try to work on fisheries, um, let's say also on fisheries um, issues such as sustainable and ecosystem-based management of fisheries. You cannot do that without having an IUU component. So you need to work with IUU issues as well. We support FAO in trying to um, trying to really you know, strengthen their cap capability to, to tackle IUU through um, the PSMA, Port State Measures Agreement. Again, there's a lot of things that you need to do, uh, but going into the PSMA and actually really working on these um, topics and having FAO um, helping out, we think is a good way uh, forward or forward also. So that is something we will continue supporting. We've done that since 2017. Um, but I also want to uh, highlight the, um, something that Gina also took up about the conditions on a fisheries boat. So this is something we also support. It's a bit new. So we support ILO with, um, it's an Alliance 8.7 Accelerator Lab to combat modern slavery. And the project aims at uh, reducing the prevalence and the scope of modern slavery in the fishery sector in Ghana, South Africa, and Indonesia. And this is going to go on at least until 2023. And I think due to COVID pandemic, it, it will be um, an extension of course, because many things stopped during that period, unfortunately. But I mean, just I don't know how many minutes I have. I think you know the 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 recommendation, the highlights that are done here in this in this new report, uh, both on the beneficial ownership and the necessary necessity of having public um, uh, registers on this. Um, you mentioned Erin uh, uh, Fiti as an initiative, and if there's any other initiatives on our radar. 
I do want to mention also that there is this Copenhagen Declaration Against Transnational Organized Crime in the global fishing industry. This was adopted in 2018. And I think there has been a lot of work on, on that, trying to really get countries on board uh, and to um, uh, sign uh, the declaration. So I think that's an important job as well. It's on a political, much higher political level. Um, as for, you know, having fish, fisheries being part of AET, being more or less, you know, defined as an extractive industry, or to actually support and work on the FITI, which is a sister organization to AET, you would say. It's the same kind of, um, it's the same kind of setup, uh, is my understanding. Uh, I don't have any direct comments on that, actually. Uh, it depends, you know, what what you actually want to achieve by having this uh, this transparency initiative um, and the focus. Um, and then just the last point, maybe um, improving monitoring capacity, you know, for coastal states and so forth. Um, I would say that um, in many cases we hear that uh, even if they have the data uh, and we. Perhaps we do it uh, by um, funding, you know, the satellites and so forth, even if they have the data and they even get an analytical work done on the data, the capacity to actually do the, um, the control to actually go out there uh, could be very limited. So it's everything is about, you know, where to actually put that support in, in where in the, in the value chain. And then you have, of course, down the line if if you have prosecution and the whole law enforcement parts you know and the uh, capacity to actually do that um is also can also be very limited so it's yeah there's many many stops on the way so we're trying to we're trying to work on on these issues in our portfolio but i do my personal view is that way too little efforts is put on actually tackling iou and if you look at the sustainable development goals we have a goal actually and that we were supposed to be uh, reached by 2020. And I think we could now say last of November, 2022, that we haven't reached that one. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you, um, Gabriella. No, I think that you raised a really important point that I was also sort of considering as we were uh, continuing the discussion is that, you know, getting the data is one thing, but then actioning on the data is another thing. And I think that, um, you know, they don't have to be mutually exclusive initiatives and activities, but that, you know, just keeping those um, those two points in mind is that, uh, you know, I, you know, having personally worked in beneficial ownership, transparency in a number of sectors for, you know, years, um, I think that uh, this this is a serious lesson that can be taken from other um, sectors, like for example, real estate um, or, or, or any of the other extractive industry is, is how to not only build the capacity of understanding what the data shows, but then how to use it and take action and to um, you know, uh, prosecute across borders because obviously um, illicit financial flows uh, are not kept within one state by the nature of the flows. Um, and so how do um, how does law enforcement work together in different jurisdictions and how do uh, political uh, bodies support one another while maintaining sovereignty and all of these other questions, which, you know, shouldn't be overwhelming, but just something that should um, continue to stay on the, the radar as um, we all collectively um, progress the issues further and first getting the data and then again, making moves on that data. And I think, you know, one of the, the big first um, steps is to continue to show some of the cases, to show the scale, the scope, um, the, the, the interlinkages with other um, uh, predicate offenses or other human rights violations and environmental violations, um, abuses that, you know, can, can help to break down those silos that you speak of, Gabriella. Um, around like the, the initiatives at the ILO or the UNODC or um, Copenhagen, uh, you know, declaration, whoever's leading that and then how that sort of links these things together, I think is um, a really sophisticated um, suggested path forward. Um, obviously not an easy lift, but I think that discussions like this where, you know, different um, 
perspectives from that chain of uh, problems and solutions that we're discussing here today from around the world come together and sort of take their piece and are aware of the other pieces and move them all forward collectively, I think is already um, a lesson learned in action from other uh, initiatives to manage uh, financial crime um, and other extractives, but in, just in general. Um, so again, I would just uh, encourage any of the participants, um, uh, attendees, sorry, or participants, if you have a panelist, if you have questions among each other, um, to, to again, use that Q&A uh, chat box at the bottom of your screen to um, let me know if there's anything else that you would like to raise or discuss with um, any of our panelists uh, here and, um, you know, or, or, or further information or suggestions you might have, because I, I, I am aware I'm looking at the attendees list that we've got a number of, you know, experts on the um, on that list as well. So um, please feel free again to use that Q&A uh, chat box. So just one question while people are typing away furiously um, is um, what to any of the panelists, uh, what sort of suggestions or do you think, um, what do you think may help uh, the Financial Action Task Force, FATF, highlight the IUU fishing issue, uh, along with things like illegal logging or illegal mining, um, which is already seen as a crime. Would that be helpful? <clears throat> Any suggestions on how to raise that profile within FATF? Or would that be valuable? Is that worth our effort? Any thoughts on that point of view? Um, I will jump in and say yes. Um, that would be very helpful. So one of the one of the things that um, we have noticed while working at, uh, or I have noticed while we're working at uh, Pew, is that fisheries, the fisheries industry, fisheries ministries, are seen as um, secondary ministries. So they're not, it's not a treasury ministry, it's not a justice ministry, it's not a foreign affairs ministry. Um, it's not even, sometimes it's not even an environmental ministry. And so it doesn't have the resources, it doesn't have the staff, and it doesn't have the, um, I guess, the profile to bring something like IE fishing, beneficial ownership, um, it doesn't really have the profile to bring that to other ministries. And so with the FATF starting to look at things like wildlife trafficking, IUU, um, timber, I think that raises the profile of the issue across the board. Um, it, I think something else we could consider is um, something that I would hope we consider is that we are looking at we, so we're talking about fishing vessels um, specifically, but large cargo vessels, merchant vessels have to, their beneficial ownership information is already in um, the IHS uh, market data. It's already available. Um, if we were to start just referring, instead of referring to them as fishing vessels, just additional industrial vessels that need to have this information in these large databases. Um, taking the, I guess, the, the specter of fish, labeling it something specific and different. It's just a large merchant vessel. Let's just call it what it is and get that information um, and, 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 and start sort of linking these fishing vessels to other large ships that have to report this information to, um, to these large databases. I think that would, uh, that would go a very long way. Within fish, within like the fisheries community, there are also things that I think should be considered. For example, the Port State Measures Agreement that's been mentioned a bunch of times today, but um, the information that has to be transmitted via PSMA does not include beneficial ownership. It should, we should consider adding beneficial ownership to um, the information that's required to be transmitted via the PSMA. That's just a personal opinion. That's not a few opinion. No, that's great. Alfonso, did you have something to add? Yeah, I think just building on what you, Gina, you're saying, I mean, 
it, that's the issue. It's the um, fisheries ministries taking the lead when they have very weak, and we're trying to move that debate to the finance or treasury ministries. And the issue is like even physically, you go to the say fisheries ministry in, in the Gambia, and it's this is crumbling building that actually got fire. There was a fire recently, and and the issue there is that they don't even have the incentive, many of those ministries, to, to tackle the issue at all. So you have an investigation, for example, in the Gambia, the permanent secretary of fisheries ministry is being investigated for corruption linked to IEU fishing. And uh, there are recordings, even linking uh, um, allegations that the, the fisheries minister is involved as well. And what was interesting, and and I, I wish um, she's struggling at the moment, but the, uh, our, the investigator who did the Senegal case study, Senegal is this, it brands itself as this leading country almost, which shows basically in Africa for financial transparency in the fishery sector. They're very close to Fiti. Um, the, the White House recently named Senegal as one of five countries as their target countries for, yeah, transparency in the sector, but yet when we tried, when she tried to find out information, basic information of, okay, what are the vessels registered to fish in Senegal? What are these vessels? The names, just the names of the vessels. What fines have been applied for IU vessels? What IU vessels have been caught? All that, just would, they would not provide this information at all. They were keen to talk, but not to share any information. So you, you do wonder about the willingness of many of those countries most affected by IU fishing to really engage on this issue. And I think, Nicolas, it's interesting in the case in Argentina, you were mentioning when we talking earlier, that they passed recently a, a measure for greater transparency. But it would be interesting to see what you, your thoughts on that are, what the measure is. Yes, thanks, Alfonso. I think that Gina has addressed that before in the fact that um, mostly all this um, IEU fishing and violations, and they're regarded as missing measures. They're just given a fine and they're not persecuted. There is not incentive to persecute these crimes. Um, so mostly they can get away with just, uh, you know, I, sometimes in, and what we have seen is that a lot of the companies have but included into their um, business schemes, the part that they will have to bribe. The bribing part of it is included within the, the schemes of like doing business as usual. And then the fact that there is this non-willingness to persecute the offender, uh, offenders that are already, already known. I mean, that once um, in my case that I have worked within the regulatory office, we seen that there is actually not willingness to, for many reasons. One of them is that it's so difficult to go through the legal procedures and then just go through the trials and all of that, that eventually they just say, you know, we'll just, you know, we'll find you and you just keep back to doing, and then that becomes a way of doing business. Uh, and that goes for uh, also for the legal fleet. That's also because the legal fleet are also not declaring what they really have and also mismatching of what the um, higher or more expensive catch that they have and um, uh, making it be like a lesser or um, other um, species that have lesser value. Um, so all of this is very difficult to persecute. But on the other thing that uh, I think that there is, uh, we have seen a lot of policy changes that have been done through, um, mostly through the IMF and World Garden Treasury, like um, cross agendas, especially when they want to sort of open up markets and then they will come and say, okay, well, we'll just have to do, you have to re um, uh, change your public policy in this sector and have that to be done. So we have seen before that those policy changes can be made if there is also um, a willingness from other countries, especially the importing countries and the richer countries, because in the case of Latin America and specifically Chile, Peru and Argentina, most of the fleet are actually foreign owned, even the ones that are legally catching. Um, the foreign owned fleets have displaced uh, in the, since the 19, it started in the 1990s, but that has been, I think that also ha, it has to do with the fact that 
Um, the, la the long distance fleets um, have been started operating in the 70s and 80s. And then eventually all of this, you know, um, displacement of local fisheries that happened in the 90s have not been, um, they have not been follow up and changes in uh, what it really means to now have those countries into large commercial flows of uh, fishing markets that it was not the case before. And all those uh, policies and all the regulatory framework is not really in place and it's not very effective. And also there is that part that it, when if it could be effective, it's not being put in place because there is a huge lobby from uh, the different groups from companies, but also from embassies, meaning that, you know, from, from richer countries. And that especially goes in our case of Argentina to Belgium, which is now controlling the main rivers and the ports in Uruguay, but also from China and other countries. And yeah, I think that is, this, you know, there's many places in which one can act upon um, also from legal system in, in the countries, but also, you know, like sort of like adequate and seeing like a more, um, coordinated response uh, that can be put in place. And unfortunately, the South Atlantic does, have an, does not have an um, um, RFMO, so there's not a regulatory um, for the South Atlantic is just, you know, scheme uh, with through an RFMO. So that also makes it, it's an incentive for more of like chaotic situation that is happening in, with IUU. Great, no, thank you for that perspective. Um, so just one of the questions um, from the Q&A box is, um, it would be great to hear from the panelists about existing efforts to highlight and hopefully ban illegally caught seafood from entering national food chains um, and what role international institutions can play in these efforts. So um, not sure who has any thoughts on that question, but would be interested to hear from any of you on that point. Uh, Aaron, I'm just jumping in here. Please. Um, yeah. Well, existing efforts to highlight and hopefully ban illegally caught seafood from entering national food chains. Um, you have the certification schemes, uh, uh, Marine um, MSC, yes. Uh, so, so, so. And you also have that on aquaculture, ASC. So, so two, two kind of certification uh, schemes um, um, that I would say are doing a lot of work trying to um, prevent uh, illegal caught fish or marine resources to, to enter the market. However, it, you know, there's, if, if we look at the numbers that Alfonso raised in the beginning, you know, one out of five plates that I eat uh, are actually, you know, origin illegally caught. If we look at that statistics, you know, uh, one 20%, I think um, it's, 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 a, it's a huge number. Uh, I mean, it's very, it doesn't, you can't comprehend it even, you know, trying to feed your kids with fish once a week or something, you're thinking about that number. I'm thinking that these schemes where you have certification, they are needed and it's good because they, they put focus on it. And there's also, you know, there's this um, control that you're actually, uh, you need to report and you can get audited and so forth. This is good. Uh, but I, I personally think that there needs to be more on this. Uh, there needs to be more international effort in a way. You know, this is very, uh, this is this is not uh, you know it's not a regulatory uh, it's not uh, obligatory or regulatory it needs to be more this needs to be lifted and on an international level much more put attention to um, uh, I think this is this is crucial and I mean these numbers that you present now in this report uh, it is showcasing that you should raise illegal fishing uh, to uh, the same level when you're talking about illegal logging or illegal mining. I mean, this is, and and it's, uh, we're running out of time. Do, you mentioned 90% Alfonso in the beginning, that's not a very good, uh, not a very good um, uh, position to be in, uh, in terms of um, overfishing. Uh, I mean, 
and and yeah the the status of so many uh, resources so so i would say this needs to be raised on a higher level i think again this needs to be in a political uh, area where you have that kind of mandate it should not be a secondary ministry as also pointed out you know fisheries um, ministries not being perhaps the ones that have the the best um, um, negotiation situation but still well trying to figure out how in the best way to put this forward uh, where you have primary ministries or, or political arenas where you really can take that discuss discussion and try to emphasize that this is this is of global interest it's not just about the depriving of resources from from global south to global north it's 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 about it, this is a common good and this is we're completely dependent on so many of these systems to work uh, on an ecosystem uh, based um, manner you know so so yeah there, there's so many issues there so trying to figure out how to do that yeah well, if I may. sure nicholas go ahead and then alfonso please yeah, just briefly, and they, uh, I'm just addressing something very important that Gabriela just mentioned is that MSC has now is part and been bought by Unilever Corporation. So it's difficult that we now have this traceability schemes done by private corporations, the largest in the world. So they're on this, both sides of the country. And when we were in Argentina working on these issues, we have, uh, I think that Iceland is the only country, I think so far they have a public system traceability for their fisheries. So we try to put in place something that is been done publicly and not through a private corporation, not because it's not working, but because eventually what has happened in a place in Argentina is that when you go through MSC, what happened is that you have a better access to market, especially to the European Union or Japan, but that does not necessarily means that eventually the MSC is got into the ships and seen exactly what is going on. It's like you pay quite a good amount of money to MSC, but and the, the expectation of the um, commercial owners of ships is that they will have a better access to, the, uh, to their market, but not necessarily that the MSC will, because a lot of what that MSC is doing is is good, but it's not really enough. They don't. Re they just send um, their uh, supervisors once a year. They'll check on the ship, and they can't come back for a whole full year. So I think what we're really looking at is not leaving all this um, regulatory frameworks only to the private to the private sector is ultimately benefiting from this the industry, and we have to do that. And we I think the um, FAO needs to step in, and also the European Union and try to help countries to do traceability themselves and then do a, do a double traceability, one from the country from origin and then on the country of London. That will also help a lot. And I think there will be a more strict control of what is really going on. That, that's it, yes. Thank you. Alfonso? Yeah, following up on what Gabriela was saying, it's really interesting because I won't name a company, but a major company came back to one of a journalist and they said, actually we are fine we are we are not our vessels are not part of the iu rfmo unified list it is by regional fisheries management organizations we have been praised to by just being very cooperative so in a way you can see that some companies are using the current to put it in a way messed up system of certification messed up system of control but there is no you truly unified IU list. The one RFMO is very political, and people in the government will tell you that it's a negotiation between countries, etc. Vessels get into that list, get out of that list, so it's not representative at all. And you can see now we've got to the point that the companies use this system, this uh, dysfunctional system, to clear their image and to say, actually, we are we are we are fine. And then they would use certification systems to back back that up. So it is, I mean, it is alarming. I mean, and, and that added to the fact that, for example, in Argentina, we find, and, and Nicolás found, that one or two vessels every year are caught for IU fishing, but we know that it's between 300 and 500 vessels, a suspected 
of IU fishing every year. So even the IU list, even if it's unified, it just represents the tip of the iceberg of what's going on. So, I mean, you, you really are facing a sector that is completely dysfunctional and beneficial ownership is so basic, but let alone even the more basic steps like a uni truly unified IU list that's publicly available doesn't exist. So I would say I'm not very, very optimistic, frankly, even even by raising this issue that something will will be done. I don't know what if others feel like that or not. And I would be interested in uh, Spurgeon Kassiri from Africa as well to see if he what he thinks. Yeah, Fonte, I think that the certification bodies is not something new that are being manipulated. I think there's significant lessons that can be learned, be learned from everything from apparel to timber to you know any other um, products like that. So I think that the issues that you guys are raising um, are, are but can benefit from the experience of some of those um, sectors that have gone through you know various iterations of certification bodies and initiatives. So I think that um, that raises a good point uh, in that you know that the, there's a lot to be taken from from other uh, sectors even beyond extractives, which um, is something worth highlighting here in this discussion. Um, so just to say that um, we're running up on one minute left. And so I just wanted to take the liberty to again, thank our panelists and attendees for joining us today. And just to um, quickly recap what stood out to me is that um, financial transparency is a significant issue and driver, of course, because, you know, money talks um, in this issue of, um, illicit, you know, IUU fishing. Um, I think that it's an important and it's coming out in this discussion that it's a um, very important and valuable entry point to raise um, not only the issue specifically of IU fishing but other predicate offenses that um, uh, connect to it um, that range everything from labor to sustainability to um, on the ground impacts to high level uh, government commitments in various fora. Um, I think that you know something that stands out is that, uh, as with any good campaign, um, it's going to take a multifaceted approach. But um, several lessons learned from other sectors um, are valuable. While this is a unique um, issue and a complex one that we've raised, and I think highlighted here is that you know some of the main focal points will be increasing that political will, power, and capacity um, to make moves wants things like beneficial ownership information are, is available um, and even more basic information that Alfonso just touched on. I think that um, there's real value in linking the impacts of, of this, um, of harms related to IEU uh, fishing to, again, other sectors and other, um, uh, you know, initiatives that um, as I think Gabrielle mentioned, so that we're breaking down silos um, and merging considerations around everything again from labor to corruption to sustainability um, to food concerns, um, all those those topics that come into this. Um, and then last but not least, I think continuing to raise the profile. I think what we're seeing here is real tangible numbers coming out of the research that are eye-opening and that can't be ignored. And so I think that this is, you know, a really this report and this discussion and the reports that Gabriella mentioned from from Pew and in general are really uh, valuable to advancing the conversation um, at both the national and international levels because I think we all can agree that initiatives at both you know both levels will be really important regional including to advance the initiatives but that I think that uh, uh, you know some of the, the, the very um, initial groundwork steps have been made and the, the, the points are being made and now it's a matter of actioning and getting the, the word out. So um, thank you so much for helping us do that today. And um, I will leave you uh, here, but I'm happy to continue the discussion over email or in future panels. So please do keep in touch with the FTC and with each other. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good day, evening, morning, all the things. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone.